Welcome to Wheelock's Latin chapter 34. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at deponent verbs, semi-deponent verbs, and then ablative with special deponents. Let's take a look first at our deponent verbs. Well, what is a deponent verb? A deponent verb is a verb that has a passive form in most forms, but will translate as active. A couple of things to keep in mind as we look at deponent verbs. First, there are only a few new forms here that we need to memorize. Uh, basically, our imperative uh, will be new forms. Everything else will be forms we've already learned. Now, there are a few exceptions to the passive form active meaning rule. We'll look at what those exceptions are here in just a minute. Keep in mind also that deponent verbs only have three principal parts. Basically, they're missing that third principal part that we would use to form the active voice perfect system. And since there is no active voice forms, uh, we don't need the, um, uh, we don't need that, there's no active perfect forms, we don't need that third principal part. So you, you won't have that at all. And then uh, keep in mind that all four conjugations are represented in this special category of verbs. Uh, so first, in other words, there can be deponent verbs that are first conjugation verbs, second, third, fourth uh, conjugations. Now, before we look at the new forms uh, that we're going to have to learn for these deponent verbs, I, I want to remind you of some old forms in the imperative that we have already learned. Uh, here we have the uh, first conjugation verb, amo, amari, amawi, amatum. And you remember the singular and plural imperatives, ama and amate for the plural. Uh, that is the former uh, or old forms that we've previously learned. What we haven't learned uh, is the passive uh, imperatives. We simply haven't learned them because it hasn't been a part of our studies thus far. It's mostly in the deponent verbs that we see these forms, but we want to go ahead and show them to you. Now, before I show you the deponent forms, I want to show you a, a standard verb that you are already familiar with, amoamari amawimatum. So in the passive form, the singular imperative is amare. Now, keep in mind, this is the exact same form as the passive indicative present singular person singular alternative form. Now, let me go back here. You go back and think here. Passive indicative, present tense, second person singular. This is an alternative form that was used in really early Latin, and we haven't really looked at it previously, but this form can be found as a passive indicative uh, present tense second person singular, amare. Now, you do know the form as the active present infinitive, the second principal part, amare. All that to say is that this form can also be the passive imperative singular. So when you see this word, it is potentially, at this point, you've always, when you see this word, you've always just gone with uh, to love. It's the infinitive. But it is possible now, and we're introducing this to you, it will be rare for non-deponent verbs, but it is possible for it to be the passive imperative singular. Uh, in the same um, form here, or the same way, the plural imperative of the passive is the same form as the passive indicative present second person plural, amamini, amamini. So it, this th throwing you a little bit of a curveball here because again you've seen these forms before, but they're different meanings. Uh, Amari, you're used to being a second person. Excuse me, a um, uh, present infinitive. I've also now introduced to you the fact that it actually has another form, passive indicative present second person singular which we've not really seen. Um, and so um, it, it's a little bit of a, a, a shock to the system, maybe, uh, to, to learn that Amare had another form that we hadn't even learned, and now to be introduced on top of that, the fact that it has a different potential meaning. It could be the passive imperative singular. So you just have to keep that in mind here. Memorize this new form, and then uh, subsequently also the new plural form of this passive imperative, which is Amamini, which again, you have already seen this as the passive indicative present second person plural. You've already seen this form, uh, but now it has another possibility. Now, again, you're rarely gonna see this in non-deponent verbs, but I did wanna point out that it isn't just in deponent verbs that these forms exist, these passive imperatives. Regular verbs have passive imperatives, and this is what they look like. Now, 
let's move into our current study of deponent verbs and see what this looks like. Here we go. Here we have the deponent verb hortor, hortari, hortatum sum. And in keeping with our new rule that we learned about deponent verbs is that you have a passive form but with a, uh, an active meaning. So here we take the passive imperative, what we would normally say is a passive form um, imperative, hortare, which again is going to be in, uh, identical to the passive indicative present second person singular uh, alternative spelling. Uh, it's also going to be the same form as the non-existent active present infinitive. We don't have this because, again, only passive forms, but it, it would look like the active present infinitive if it had one. And then, of course, here for the imperative uh, in the plural, it's hortameni, which, again, is the same form as the passive indicative present tense second person plural. So for both of these forms, hort hortare and hortameni, uh, you'll have to let context determine whether or not this is an imperative, singular, plural, or that this is a passive, um, present, indicative form, second person, singular, or plural. Uh, you'll have to let context tell you. And again, the hortare is an alternative spelling, which is rarely seen in the present tense, but it is a possibility. Uh, more likely, it, it is going to be your uh, imperative. Uh, hortameni is another another question altogether because this is the the normal form for passive uh, indicative present second person plural and so context will have to tell you if it's uh, that or the imperative plural so those are two new forms it's the only new forms you have to learn for the deponent verbs and so just take the time if you need to pause and go back and reread this and re-listen look and go ahead and read in Wheelox and see if you can't get further clarification if you need it Let's move on to now our exceptions to the deponent rule uh, that everything is passive form with active meanings. Here are the two places that we're going to find exceptions, participles and infinitives. With the participles, we're going to have the present and future participles that have active forms and active meanings. So this is breaking the normal rule of passive form active meanings. Here you will have the present and future participles just as you normally would see them. They're formed as you would normally expect, but they will have active meanings. Now, the future passive participle, which we call the gerundive, will have a passive form with a passive meaning. So again, this is breaking the rule. Participles is breaking the rules all the way around here. It will have the, the, the normal passive form with the ND infix, inf, infix excuse me, and uh, but it will have passive meaning. Now, the one place that it does not break the rule, and that's why I've highlighted this in green here, it's the perfect participle. And it will have the passive form an active meaning. This will hold to, hold true to the deponent rule. But it's the only one of the four participles that does. The other three participles, you have to remember these rules. Uh, active form, active meaning for present and future. Passive form, passive meaning for the gerundive or future passive participle. Now what about infinitives? Well, infinitives, keep in mind that there are only three infinitives in deponents. We don't have six, we only have three. And the one place that it breaks the rules is the future infinitive. There's only a future infinitive. It is the active form, and it has an active meaning. All right, now, the other two infinitives are going to be the present and perfect infinitive, and they will be in the passive form, but again, active meaning. So again, that's why I've highlighted, highlighted this green. This will hold true to the deponent rule. Uh, present and perfect infinitive passive form, but active meaning. So let's look at two charts that will help illustrate this. Here is our participle chart using the uh, sample here, the deponent sample hortor. You would have, this is a first conjugation uh, deponent verb, so that's why we have the, uh, the controlling vowel, the stem vowel A, long A, so it's hortans, hortantis, and this is an active form and an active meaning, urging. And then the future participle, it is a future form, hort, hortatorus aum, and it has an active meaning, about to urge. 
So those uh, are breaking the deponent rule. The gerundive form, the future passive, hortandus aum, again, breaks the, the deponent rule. It has the passive form and the passive meaning, about to be urged. The only place that has the deponent rule intact here is the perfect passive here. It's a passive form, hortatus aum, and it's translated uh, as an active form, having urged. If it were passive, it would be having been urged, but it's not. It's active form. So the passive perfect is the only participial form that holds true to the deponent rule. And now let's look at the infinitive chart. Again, we would normally expect six infinitives, but there's only three. And the future active um, breaks the rule, hortatorus aum esse. And it has the active meaning and the active form to be about to urge. To be about to urge. So that's, um, that's the translation there. Now for the passive present, passive perfect, again, passive forms. These will hold true to the deponent rule. Passive forms, hortari, hortatus aum esse. But they will have active meanings. To urge, to have urged. So those... Those are our exceptions to the deponent rules in the participles and the infinitive. So take the time to learn those rules and memorize them. Now, there is a special category of semi-deponent verbs. I know what you're thinking. You want to throw something at me. I did not invent the grammar rules, all right? Uh, but it's not too terrible. These are some verbs that are normally uh, in the, uh, normal in the, in the present system. They will look just as you would expect them to look in the present system and have the um, uh, regular meanings, but they are deponent in the perfect system. In other words, their perfect system will have passive, um, uh, passive forms, but active translations or meanings. And their principal parts will indicate their semi-deponent status. It'll be pretty uh, apparent. So let's take a quick look at this. Ad -o -ad uh, there's no third principal part. And then asusum. So you have the first two principal parts will look like they're in the active form. We don't have ad or or ad iri with the long i there in the second principal part. So that tells you that those are active in form. But then when you look at the fourth principal part, you've got the sum there. And, and that tells you that this is a passive uh, perfect participle kind of form here. This is how we form the perfect passive um, in, the, um, in, the, in the perfect system. So uh, this word means to dare, and so this is a semi-deponent verb. And there's another one. These are both very frequently used. Ada o aderi, to dare, and then gada o gaderi, ga wisusum, to rejoice. So perfect system, uh, they will be deponent, but in the present system, they will be just normal, regular verbs. All right, and then finally, ablative with special deponent. This is uh, one of many uses of the ablative that we've studied thus far. This one's pretty simple. This is the ablative case will be used as the direct object with a few deponent verbs. And here are a few of them, utor, uti, ususum, to use. Uh, we get the word utility or useful here, and uh, this one is used a lot. Now, Wilox does not really use the rest of these, uh, but they, they are a part of this category of um, deponent verbs that require an ablative uh, as a direct object. Fruor, frui, fructusum, to enjoy. Uh, fungor, fungi, functusum, to perform. Potior, poteri, potisus, uh, excuse me, potitus sum, to possess, and wescor, wesci, to eat. So these are all um, special deponents that require the ablative in the direct object. And here's two sentences to quickly illustrate this. Utitor stylo. He is using a pencil. So you've got the deponent verb utitor in the... Um, Present tense, third person singular. And remember, because it's deponent, we don't translate this as passive. It definitely has that passive ending. So it tells you that it's deponent, but we translate it as, as active. So he is using stilo, a pencil. Now, you would expect this um, to, to have a direct object, an accusative direct object, but we don't. We have that long O 
and that tells you it's ablative. So this is a deponent verb that requires an ablative as a direct object. He is using a pencil. And, and there is uh, evidence to suggest this is basically... Um, uh, this basically came from an ablative of means. He is using or he's benefiting by use of a pencil is essentially what this is. One more example here. Non adent uti navibus. Uh, non adent, they do not dare. This is a deponent verb here. They do not dare. Uh, the passive, or I should say the deponent infinitive here, uti, it's a passive form. They do not dare to use Nawabu ships. Again, this is ablative ships because abdent requires, um, excuse me, uh, uti requires uh, the ablative as the direct object. This is the direct object of the infinitive uti. So they do not dare to use the ships. Uh, ablative form rather than accusative. All right, uh, take the time to read through Wheelocks in this chapter carefully. Review this video as you need. And of course, don't forget to study the vocabulary. We will have a quiz later. Have a good day.